I did a commerce degree at Newcastle University and when I finished I got a job and that wasn't very exciting uh, and so I decided to go back to university um, and uh, because I'd done reasonably well uh, I was uh, tutoring and so in order to stay in that gig you have to um, study. So there was no honours program at Newcastle at the time, it had, it had wound up so I did what they called an honours equivalent year and in that um, year I did a piece of research around um, how banks and finance companies make lending decisions for small firms. Um, in the assessment of that I received a credit which I was really annoyed about uh, so I sent the paper off to a journal and it was published uh, and one of my mates who was also in the program photocopied it, put it on the professor's door and said this is only a credit at Newcastle. So that probably got me, got me started on the research bug. Um, at the end of that year I'd finished um, there was no uh, budget for the tutoring that I was doing, uh, so I was basically unemployed. I'd been married a week. Uh, <laughs> and so, um, but, but one of the professors at uh, ANU, Australian National University, had read my paper uh, and invited me down uh, for a chat. Uh, in those days, it was a good seven hour drive from Newcastle to Canberra, so it was um, uh, a long way to cogitate about what the hell I was doing. Um, and when I got there, we talked about my research and researching in this field was fairly new uh, and that I should do a PhD uh, and uh, my initial response was no but when I got home and realised I was still unemployed uh, I went back to ANU as, in those days as a tutor and then senior tutor while I did my PhD um, and it was uh, that was the start of my research career. So when I went to ANU, um, this is 1985, <laughs> Uh, no one was researching small firms because they weren't considered to be, you know, they, they, weren't, they didn't have a stock price. Everyone was st studying share prices and no one was really interested in the, the biggest part of the private sector. 96% of firms are small and run by families and decisions made by families. So what I was really interested in was the difference between large firms who have in-house counsel and accountants and everything else and a small firm where the risk exposure is really high. They've got one investment, coffee shop or whatever it might be, a uh, little manufacturing plant, and how they made decisions and the fineness of the information they used. And so I did a study in conjunction with ABS data that the ABS collected for me uh, that looked at the types of information different firms used. And then we'd build a model to predict the types of information that firms would use given certain characteristics. And that went on to be published by the Bureau of um, Industry Economics at the time in Canberra and sort of set in train a whole series of research uh, that's followed since then. Um, particular focus on uh, risk, perceptions of risk and um, how um, the non-small business sector perceives the risk of, the, of that sector. Uh, and one of the papers that we published from that in 2003, I think it was, uh, is the, one of the most cited papers in the, in the journal that it was published in. So, you know, we started to make an impact in that and have always been felt intrinsically like we never really understand that sector. So after 30 years of research, I still feel like we don't understand it because it's, so, it's just a natural extension of an individual. And so uh, in um, uh, two years ago, I invented the factor maps, which is uh, the way to collect data that's qualitative and can be made quantitative, if that makes sense. And that work really gives us a massive insight into the sector uh, and was just published by the Reserve Bank of Australia. When I did my inaugural address as professor uh, at uh, Newcastle, but I'd already, I'd already been a prof at QUT, but came back to Newcastle, did my, I called it Confessions of a Failed Empiricist um, because um, I, I used a lot of um, survey-based method, but it really didn't give us the insights into the actual human nature of the firm until, you know, fast forward 17 years, 18 years later, and I finally think we've got to come a long way forward with the factor maps. So they're using uh, perception-based data to look at how firms feel about their performance, which is basically the individuals, because they are the firms, and then we're able to break the economy into five different segments, which I call tribes. And there's five different key components of the economy based on the perceptions of these owners of their performance. And uh, I think that's been a real breakthrough. In fact, uh, the Financial Review described it as a game changer for policy in Australia. Uh, so I was pretty proud about that. Uh, I was uh, invited to go and um, visit, uh, to be a visitor at the Reserve Bank. 
and uh, they were grappling at the time with a better understanding of the small firm sector, uh, particularly as the it's politically very sensitive. Uh, and there's been several Senate inquiries into access to finance, and um, it was pretty clear that to the Reserve Bank they needed to understand better that sector. Uh, and we were sitting around in a room, and I said, "Wouldn't it be good to know what they think? Wouldn't it be good if we could just ask them to to, to pull some pull the issues down and around us so we can see their relative importance?" And then on a piece of A3 paper, I just drew these circles on a dartboard and I said wouldn't it be good if we could get them to pull it and then I went why couldn't we and from there uh, well, uh, in conjunction with a large private sector data firm we built the model which is now used um, uh, in many different situations and we're in discussions with some of the big government agencies about using it as well. I think it's the narrowness of the training that I had and others have in that you don't you tend to stick to the nitty uh, whereas I think if you actually took me you know, a long time, I mean, I've been a professor for 27 years. <laughs> I mean, it took me a long time to get out of my comfort zone. And I think sometimes we've just got to get out of our comfort zone. Um, you know, um, qualitative was um, soft and, <laughs> and, and so I'd, I was always trying to build the big data set, but the big data set wasn't necessarily answering the question. It was just getting bigger. <laughs> so I think sometimes you've got to get out of your comfort zone and, and but also seek out the right people to support you and give you the advice and, 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 and be prepared to work in teams that are going to um, threaten that comfort zone. Um, one of the th challenges I had recently with a PhD student was they had 10 years of data, a time series that I couldn't possibly get my head around. So search out the right person to get their head around it and help you. I think that's, that's really critical. Get engaged. Uh, get, get, be prepared to give your research papers at different places, uh, not at not at um, some exotic conference overseas, but at another another seminar series at another good university. Um, be prepared to be challenged. Um, some of the best work I ever published was torn apart in those seminars, and I had to rethink and restart a lot of it because you know I was able to get those fresh set of eyes on my work. Um, I think that you know don't don't just um, stick to the supervisor's plan uh, if you if you really want to challenge and make sure your work is going to be as the highest standard then seek the challenge it's like uh, a business model where you seek to break the business idea you know try and try and get someone to try and break your research um, they'll be able to because no research is perfect so put that in context but from my point of view I think it's about being challenged and accepting that that's what academic life's about. It, we shouldn't be doing it for the sake of it. I mean, there are reasons why you might, theoretical math, etc., which is important, but at the end of the day, in social sciences in particular, there's got to be some outcome that's got value to not just you in your career. Um, and so from my point of view, um, it, it's about being able to say what's changed as a consequence of the investment that's been made in each individual researcher and in research groups. Uh, in my particular case, I hope <laughs> there's been a significant change in attitudes towards research in this area uh, for a start. But secondly, um, that there's been uh, uh, an understanding of the value of these firms and how they are extensions of individuals and how decision processes are not like they are w between shareholders and management at BHP. Um, and, uh, you know, when when um, the paper was published, um, the Five Tribes paper was published, it was read into the Hansard uh, by one of the federal politicians because they could see the, the value in getting this in the public domain. Well, the Reserve Banks put it in the public domain anyway. Um, but the, the next step for me is, um, is working on uh, a broader set of uh, analysis around the differences between subsectors. And we, uh, and we started that process, we just finalised the paper today. So. Um, you know, I think the important thing is you never lose the, the bug for the question and uh, I've still got that bug even though I'm, I'm in a different role.